right, the remedial group. Morning choir, y'all come on in. Good morning. Welcome to Lester Memorial United Methodist Church. Delighted you're here this morning, especially those of you who may be visiting with us. Uh, and a special good morning to our radio and television congregation. It's nice having you worship with us this morning again also. Got a, a lot going on this coming week. I want to call your attention to a few announcements but first I want to say uh, and I don't know maybe age changes a lot of things and I'm starting to have weaker moments or whatever but I want to thank Dana for filling in for me last week and doing an outstanding job I, I cannot say enough about you doing that but I'll try next time you know. No, I told her, I had her nervous this morning. I said, I may just, may just compliment you, Dana. And uh, got her a little nervous, but thank you so much. Uh, we have a, a good back and forth rapport with each other. Uh, where to start? Next Sunday, we're going to have the, the United Methodist Men's Club is having a Bill Denson's calling it a food and fun luncheon, but those of us that have been around, we're calling it a fundraiser. It, uh, it's not, we're not going to ask you to critique us on presentation on the food, but we're going to ask you to bring your checkbook and uh, write a check and enjoy that savory Italian spaghetti and uh, the marinara and meat sauce and salad and stuff. And, uh, but our men's club is stepping out on faith on a, a pretty large commitment that's fixing to take place in August. And we, we don't know how prepared we are for it as far as attendance turn out and all, but we do know that it's carrying a pretty hefty financial tag to it. Uh, the trophies of grace uh, the Whitetail Adventure, you've seen it, I think, in the bulletin. You maybe start seeing some circulars around town and some talk show spots and this sort of thing. But it's an outreach to, uh, to bring in uh, not just men, but families and to see some of the, the most gorgeous replicas of trophy deer that have ever been taken in this country, all followed by uh, a barbecue dinner for 300 people that show up free and then hear an inspiration speaker before the service is over. And uh, they will hear, I'm told, uh, an outstanding message. So be in prayer for the United Methodist Men's Club uh, in the next several weeks and do support the luncheon next Sunday in the fellowship hall. We, we are gonna have, I found out this week, some entertainment. Uh, a, a violinist, a well-known violinist uh, from Blount County will be performing and I talked to him this morning and uh, he said here's the deal if people would write a nice check I'll only play one song and leave 
But he said, if it's, you know, if it's going to cut a check for $5, I'm playing 20 songs, and they're going to hear all of them. <laughs> and uh, I know this violinist, and I think you'd rather cut a nice check <laughs> and, and hear one. But uh, please support it and uh, do what you can to help us. A uh, couple of other things. Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, we're having a, a drive uh, for tools, equipment, and so forth for the West Virginia flood victims. That, uh, and there's a Narthex over there, I mean, uh, next door. Uh, annex full of materials and tools, stuff that's gonna be making its way to West Virginia for people. And there's a list in your building of what, what's needed. So please do that. Also next Sunday, uh, we will have our healing service at 945 uh, here in the sanctuary and then during the Sunday school hour we have a guest missionary David Macabo uh, he's 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 serving in Senegal currently and uh, he's worked with Anna and Edward and he will be sharing I think briefly at both services but during the Sunday school hour he has uh, would like to share with those classes who are interested in hearing him uh, remind you of Monday night and Monday morning Bible studies and Wednesday night Bible studies. Celebrate recovery. We'll meet as usual 545 on Monday evenings. And one last uh, announcement that Joe had reminded me of was Rhonda Tenney needs a teacher for Wednesday night. And I can't remember what it's for, but uh, if you are available and would like to help out, please see Rhonda Tenney. Again, we're delighted you're here this morning, and uh, may God truly bless us this hour. Thank you. First hymn is 402, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. Let's stand and sing.
The Apostles' Creed is found in your bulletin. Join with me as we affirm our belief as Christians. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Thank you. you. May be seated. Glad you're here today. It's been a tough week. Uh, what better place to be than in the house of the Lord uh, as we uh, as we worship and uh, and give thanks to Him? I have a long list of uh, prayer requests. I want to turn your attention to. If you would take our our little insert in the bulletin home with you and pray for these names each day. Uh, certainly, we mourn the loss of Mike Bashirs. Uh, many of you know that Mike passed away early in the week. Um, I talked to Judy this morning. The, the family is doing well, and they want us to celebrate Mike's life, not grieve for his passing, but celebrate uh, his life. And there will be a reception this coming Saturday from 2 to 4 in the fellowship hall. Uh, we've prayed for a long time for Renee McGill, who is Debbie and Gary McGill's uh, daughter-in-law over in Tuscaloosa. Uh, and, and for the family of little Alexis Payne, whose funeral was here uh, Wednesday morning, uh, we grieve with them as well for the loss that we had. But there's good news. We've had good reports from heart tests. Uh, we praise God for that. Uh, we've had two births. We, Betty Ward has got a new great-granddaughter on Friday, and uh, Donna and Barry Wilson have a new grandson, which you need to talk to them about the story about how that little boy got here. So uh, God is on the throne uh, amidst all the bad things that are happening. God is on the throne and we worship a, a risen Lord. So let's go to God in prayer. After we sing our praise Him, Spirit of the Living God. Almighty God, how great you are. We praise you for who you are and what you are in our lives. God, we, we thank you for the gift that you have given us through your son, Christ Jesus, who went to the cross on our behalf. And through your power, you raised him so that death is not something we have to fear. And God, we have talked about death way too much this week. Uh, our hearts are broken at the loss that we have experienced and those that we love that have been taken from us too quickly, for the loss that people have experienced all across our nation and the world. Lord, sometimes it seems like the, the forces of evil and wickedness are, are gaining the upper hand, and yet we acknowledge that you are on the throne, that you are God, and that you will prevail. Lord, we ask a special prayer for all those on our, our prayer list this morning. We celebrate the life of, of Mike, Vern. Uh, God, we love him so much, and uh, we miss him. Our hearts are broken. God, for the family of Alexis Payne, who was taken way too early as a child, 
we mourn for her and for the McGill family in the mourning of, of their passing of, of their daughter-in-law. Lord, so many are sick. Um, we have so many on our prayer list who are in need of a miracle. Uh, God, if you're willing, you can make them well. And we pray that right now, that you would, you would heal each need, that you would meet each need, whatever it might be. And God, in the midst of pain and suffering, we, we celebrate new life for, the, for Betty's new great-granddaughter and Barry and Donna's new grandson, for the voices of children who, who let us know that you believe in this world and you believe in us and that this, this world um, is yours. Lord, we thank you for our church. We thank you for Barry and his leadership. God, we ask that you would um, draw us closer to you so that as we leave this house today, we might go into the world uh, as redeemed people to spread your news. Lord, we pray now a, a prayer of confession that we acknowledge the sin in our own life, God. We, we ask that you would forgive us for those many times that we have failed you, for those times that we have done things against your will, and perhaps left undone those things you ask us to do. Forgive us, God. Forgive us for the complicity that we might have uh, in any hurt or pain in this world. Lord, above all, we acknowledge you as the Lord and Savior of our lives, and we ask that you would make us humble, obedient servants in all that we do. And we make this our prayer in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn is number 356, When We Are Living. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for all that you have done for us and for everything you continue to do for us through the gift of your spirit. Help us to show our gratitude not only through these gifts, but through the love that we show our community. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
And I especially want to thank Cindy. She played the flute part yesterday, last week and this week, and that adds so much. I want to thank those of you who returned today, knowing what you were going to get. Uh, that's a, a real affirmation. I don't care what you say, I, but I, I appreciate it. And I promise that Barry is, uh, will be back here in this place where he belongs next week. But I have appreciated the, uh, the opportunity to, to share with you. Um, just then... A lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your, all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side as well. But a Samaritan, while traveling on the road, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I'll repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Well, who doesn't know the parable of the Good Samaritan? I suspect that it would rank in, in at least the top five of most well-known stories in the Bible. Everyone wants to be known as the Good Samaritan. We got a call the other night from Meredith out in Seattle. It was raining and she had a flat tire. Well, a stranger, she didn't know, came, helped her get her tire fixed. He was a good Samaritan to her. There's even a good Sam club for those who have RVs. Everybody knows the story of the good Samaritan. And because of its familiarity to us, sometimes I think we risk taking it a little too casually and, and fail to let it really affect us. And rather than focus on the parable right away, I think it might be good to think about what prompted Jesus to tell the story of the Good Samaritan. The Scripture says, just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Well, I should probably insert a couple of lawyer jokes right here, but since I have one in my own family, I'll, I'll refrain from that. Except for that one time that St. Peter met a new arrival at the pearly gates, and he and the angels rolled out the red carpet for this guy. They had confetti. They, they just gave him the five-star treatment. It just went on and on. And um, one of the angels off to the side said, well, who is this guy? He doesn't, look too, he doesn't look too special. What's the big deal about him? And Peter said, that's a lawyer. We don't get too many of them up here. <laughs> the lawyer's question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, lawyers in the New Testament in Jesus' day studied and interpreted all the many laws and commandments that God gave in the Old Testament in the Torah. Their intent was to give the people an adequate interpretation and application of divine law to every situation of life. The lawyer asked Jesus in order to test him. 
Well, we've heard that question before, haven't we? Remember the, the rich young man in Mark 10? He ran up to Jesus, fell on his knees, and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, his didn't sound so much like a test as it did a sincere desire to know, am I on the right track? Am I doing what I need to do? We've heard this in other places as well. What's this life all about? How do I find meaning today that's going to have any kind of eternal significance? What must I do to have eternal life? And what is eternal life anyway? Some, I read somewhere that somebody said that for a lot of people, the question is not, is there life after death? The question is, is there life after birth? Well, we've been reminded this week of the transient nature of this life. People that we love, both in our church family and in our extended families, have left us way too soon. What does it mean for us to truly live in the time that we have left on this earth? Well, we may not have the same motive as the lawyer, but I think each of us has asked this same question before. As followers of Jesus, how do we make our lives matter? Well, when we think of eternal life, what, what do we think of? Going to heaven when we die. Sometimes we think of immortality, living forever. Well, that doesn't sound like such a bad plan. You know, I could, I could do that. But it didn't work out so well if you remember the story from Greek mythology for the man who, who asked for eternal life, which was given, but he didn't ask for eternal youth. So he just got older and older and older. Living forever was not what the lawyer had in his mind when he asked Jesus this question. The Jewish people in Jesus' time thought in terms of, of two ages. The present age and the age to come. Well, the Jewish people believed that in the age to come, God would restore Israel to its rightful place among the nations. Remember, they were the chosen people. And the injustice, rebellion, and evil of this age would be replaced by the peace and righteousness and justice that came from a life with God as God would have it. Israel would be judged and those who were faithful adherents, adherents of the law would take the place with God and reign forever. Obedience to the law would be the way that faithful Jews would inherit eternal life in the coming age. Jesus was actually introducing an entirely new way of understanding what eternal life actually means. As one commentator said, Jesus is not arguing for a way of existing beyond this world. He is, a, he is arguing for a way of attaining a radically different way of existing in this world, where we are now. We need to see salvation and eternal life as more than just saying a simple prayer in a single moment. And see that it includes more than that. A life of holiness growing into the people that God intends us to be. More on that in just a minute. Well, the lawyer wanted to test Jesus. Now, I've watched enough law and order to know that lawyers don't ask questions that they don't already know the answer to. The lawyer knew the answer that he was expecting, right? He knew what Jesus was supposed to say. And the question was, would Jesus toe the party line or not? The lawyer knew that faithful obedience to the law was the way to inherit eternal life. What must I do, the lawyer asked. Well, Jesus said, how do you read the law? How do you interpret it? What does the law say? I wonder if the lawyer didn't pause for a minute and think before he answered. The lawyer knew the answer he was expecting. After all, that was his job. He knew the law, he knew the rules, and he knew how to keep them. Lawyer may have thought, hmm, love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself might be a good way to sum it up. I can sort of see the lawyer squirming in his seat. His test of Jesus was not really going the way that he thought maybe thought it would. You know, he might have said, Jesus is making me answer the question as if I'm the one being tested. Surely Jesus knows the kind of person I am. I've devoted my whole life to the law. I keep the entire law. Well, he finally said, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. I kind of think the lawyer may have taken a back just a little bit. And he said, is that it, Jesus? You know I've kept the law. You know what I've, that I've devoted my whole life to studying the law. And, and, and 
you can almost hear him recite his, his list of accomplishments like the Pharisee in the temple did. Remember, I, I fast, I keep the Sabbath, I don't steal. Is that it? Is that all there is to it? Well, his answer was, recorded in the Scripture, wanting to justify himself. Doesn't that sound just like us? Wanting to justify himself, he said. Well, we want to justify our actions. We want, to, we want God to, to, to give us the thumbs up, the attaboy, the, the there you go, for how we're doing in this life. Wanting to justify himself, he said, and who is my neighbor? It makes me wonder if the lawyer had ever even considered that question before. Surely his neighbor was his fellow scribes and, and the Pharisees that he worked with. Surely it was those of his tribe, of his family. Isn't that right, Jesus? I've been a neighbor to them. So who is my neighbor, Jesus? A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. We know the story. We've poo-pooed the Levite. We've mocked the priest for not stopping. We know the excuses they might have given for not stopping to help. If I touch him, I'll be unclean and won't be able to perform my, my temple duties. If I, if I get over there to help him, I'll be late for administrative council meeting. If I stop to help him, I'll, my, the casserole I've got for the women's luncheon is going to ruin. On and on and on the excuses go. We know that it was the Samaritan who stopped to help. We know that it was the Samaritan that was moved to pity and that, that stopped and bandaged his wound and poured oil and wine on his wounds. It was the hated Samaritan who loaded him up on his own donkey, took him to the inn, and paid the, the innkeeper to take care of him for a couple of days. We know that it was the despised Samaritan that did all this. Jesus asked the lawyer, who was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Well, the lawyer couldn't even say the word Samaritan. He said, the one who showed him mercy. Go and do likewise, Jesus said. You got to wonder what the lawyer thought at that point. The test for Jesus didn't work out like he thought it would. Jesus just turned all of his preconceived notions upside down. Jesus said, do this and you will live. And go and do likewise. I think he says the same thing to us today. Love God, love your neighbor. Do this and you will live. Show mercy, go and do likewise. Like the lawyer, I sometimes wonder if we don't understand what Jesus is saying on an intellectual level, but we have, a, have trouble with the application. What does it really mean to do these commandments that Jesus gives us? When it comes to actually putting them into practice, are we any better than the lawyer seemed to be? Jesus says, do this and you will live. Well, isn't that what we're looking for? Isn't that what we want to do? Is we want to live today, not just when we die and go to heaven? What is the practical application of the commandments that Jesus gives us? And, and besides, all this talk of doing stuff, doesn't that sound just a little bit like works righteousness? We good Protestants know that we're saved by faith, right? So that no one can boast, right? What do you mean, Jesus? Do this and you will live. Well, maybe we need to broaden our understanding about what salvation and eternal life actually mean. Salvation is not a one-time transaction between us and God that all we have to do is check off that box and wait for our, our, um, wait for our mansion in the sky by and by. John Wesley describes salvation as a house. Through repentance, drawn by prevenient grace of God, the grace that goes before us and, and woos us into a relationship, we come onto the porch. We enter the house through the door of justification. We are made right with God only by God's amazing grace. So yes, salvation is by faith in Christ alone. Don't hear me wrong. But we don't stay in that doorway. We move into the house and we stay into the house through God's gift of sanctifying grace. We are made into the people that God wants us to be. He, we, are, we are transformed into new creation. Well, we're not the first people to ask these questions. When John Wesley uh, was beginning the, uh, uh, the Methodist movement, he was an, uh, an Anglican priest. Some of the recent converts that he had 
came to me came to him and asked basically the same question. They said, how do we live as disciples of Jesus in our world today? Well, John Wesley agreed to meet with them on a weekly basis to give them spiritual guidance and instruction and to pray with them. From this basically modest beginning, John Wesley began to organize classes that would meet once a week to help the new converts grow in grace and in their service to God. And these classes formed the nucleus of the Methodist church that spread across England like wildfire and into the new world of America. To give them consistent instruction, he formulated the general rules of the Methodist societies, the goal of which was to teach members how to live out the commandments to love God and love our neighbor. John Wesley wanted his, his disciples to have, his converts to have some practical instruction on how to live as Jesus' disciples. Bishop Reuben Job put it like this, John Wesley was determined to foster those disciplined practices that would lead to faithfulness to the way of Jesus. They're still part of our Methodist doctrinal standards. Some of you may have seen them before. It's three simple rules. Do no harm, do good, and attend upon all the ordinances of God. In each case, John Wesley gives a pretty exhaustive list of things to do and not to do. By giving them some practical advice, he enabled them to put their faith into practice in their daily lives. We've come to know these as means of grace. We can't change ourselves, and it's the means of grace, these disciplines that we put into our lives that allow the Holy Spirit to work within us to change us. We open ourselves and yield ourselves to what God wants to do in our lives. So how do we love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength? John Wesley might begin by saying, attend upon all the ordinances of God. Bishop Job translated that into saying, stay in love with God. How do we stay in love with God? Well, the practices of worship, prayer, fasting, and Scripture study are all means that we use to open ourselves to the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Regular observance of Holy Communion. How do we love our neighbors as ourselves? Well, John Wesley might say that we would avoid anything that would take advantage of someone else and refuse to do anything that would cause harm to someone else. And importantly, he would say, be active, do good to everyone as you have chance. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick and in prisons. How do, we love ourselves, uh, how do we love our neighbors as ourselves? A couple weeks ago at Bible study, Tony asked a great question. We were talking about loving people that are difficult to love. Well, let's face it, some of us are difficult to love. His question was, how can I get myself to love these people even more? We tossed the question around a little bit. And we got the answers that you might expect. Walk a mile in their shoes. Do something nice for them. Um, see yourself in their place. And at the end, we, we basically decided, honestly, there's nothing we can do on our own to love people more. The, the kind of love that Jesus wants us to have in our heart comes only from Jesus' love present in our own lives. We love before, because He first loved us. A lady, after the early service, uh, came up to me and, and said some nice things about what I said, but she said what, what struck me the most was, was you know, I, I really, it really hit me when you said that, that we can't love those people. She said, I can't love the people that pull those triggers this week. But by the power of God, we can. Well, now there's a quick reminder. There's a danger inherent in any list of do's and don'ts. We can make anything uh, a rote following of the rules. We're, no, long, we're no, no more able to keep these rules than the scribes and Pharisees were to keep the law. Our, our focus has to be on living out our relationship with God through Jesus Christ and respond to Him through the love and grace that we receive. Well, on another occasion, a scribe asked Jesus which commandment was first of all. This time, Jesus responded directly to him, Love God, love your neighbor. There's no commandment greater than these. This, this scribe, for one, seemed to get it. He said that keeping these commandments is worth more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Jesus' response, 
you're not far from the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is about relationships with God and with our neighbor, not religious observances. As one of our youth put it, God doesn't care about your religious practices if you don't love those people you don't want to love. Do this and you will live. Go and do likewise. Keeping the commandments like Jesus means li living like God intends. The more we love God, the more we love our neighbor. The more we love our neighbor, the more we love God and can see God in our neighbor. Jesus made the lawyers see that He couldn't restrict who his, his vision of who His neighbor was. In God's eyes, we're all neighbors. To whom do we show mercy? Our family? Our fellow church members? Are we guilty of showing mercy only to those people who look like us, who act like us, who believe like us? The world wants to divide us into us versus them. Us are the good guys. Them are the bad guys. Us are the clean. Them are the unclean. Us are the natives. Them are the aliens. Us is the lawyer. Them is the Samaritan. When we allow the world to divide us into us versus them, the end result is inevitably fear. We fear that we, we fear what we don't know and what we don't understand. So I hunker down with my side, you hunker down with your side, and we wonder what the other side is up to. We worry that you're going to take what's mine. I'm, you worry, I worry that, that you're going to, to get some of mine. And it's not a, far, a, a long step from there to hating the other side. Well, I think that right now in our world, fear is a source of much of the trouble that we're having. As followers of the Prince of Peace, we cannot allow ourselves to be dominated by a spirit of fear. So many people like to foster fear because it gets them on their side. It divides, them, it divides us into us versus them. One of the most repeated phrases in the Bible is, Fear not. Fear not. Hear the word of the disciple in 1 John 4. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because He first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from Him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Love God, love your neighbor. Jesus doesn't see the world as us versus them. We are all neighbors in Jesus' kingdom. Go and do likewise. Offer grace, mercy, and love to all people, regardless of what they look like or who they are. We don't get to choose whom we will love if we are to love like Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the, the martyr in the in World War II years, said, when we become a Christian... We forfeit forever the right to choose whom we will love. We forfeit forever the right to choose whom we will love. In keeping these commandments, we learn to really live in this life. Eternal life really does begin now. Jesus lived eternal life. He said, I have come to life, give you life, and life abundantly in John 10.10. J.D. Walt in the Seedbed Daily Text this week said, As creator of life, he knows precisely how life was meant to be lived. Jesus lived eternal life. Life as Jesus means it to be lived is a life of love of God 
and love of our neighbor. A life of relationships. The abundant life Jesus promised is available to us as we keep the commandments and rely fully on Jesus and His presence with us each day. Love God, love your neighbor. Do this and you will live. Not as a box to check off, a rote performance of a set of rules, but as a lifestyle of loving as Jesus loved. Do this and you will live. Really live. Not just go through the motions of a drab and dreary existence, hoping that at the end of, all, of it all, you've done enough and will find your place in heaven. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Is there life after birth? Love God, love your neighbor. Do this and you will live. Which one of the three men was a neighbor to the man in the ditch? the one who showed mercy. Go and do likewise. The other night at Bible study, we were considering the the passage in in, uh, Matthew where where Jesus called the the disciple Matthew. Remember, he was a tax collector. And after he he called him, he went to uh, to Matthew's house to have dinner. Well, the Pharisees got all upset with him because... Uh, he was eating with sinners. Why does, your, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus' response to him was, he said, Go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. What, is our, what does it mean when we come and do our, our religious things if we don't go into the world and show mercy? Fear is abundant in our world today. And as we just said, their perfect love casts out fear. When we welcome someone into the church through profession of faith, we ask three questions, and they're these. On behalf of the church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Second, do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And third, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord. Well, I think that the the powers of uh, wickedness and the the spiritual forces of evil in this world are having a heyday about right now. Um, Too often, I think, in the church, we have offered sacrifices and not mercy. Uh, We can't love as Jesus wants us to love if we don't see that it's not us versus them. Perhaps you've answered those questions. Um, Martha and, and Beverly are going to lead us in our, in our last hymn here in just a second. Um, I, I want us to spend just a few minutes as we sing, um, and it's okay if you don't sing this last hymn, if you want to say a prayer of confession and repentance, of that, that in your life that's keeping you from God, that's keeping you from from a real experience of life by serving your neighbor. Racism, greed, pride, all these things are so prevalent in our world today. And we in the church need to be the light in the, in the darkness and not a participant in them. And I pray God that you would allow us as your servants to go into the world as changed people. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank You for Your Word. God, we pray for uh, our world. We ask that You would uh, send Your Holy Spirit, God, that hearts would be changed, uh, that love would replace hate, that fear would be vanquished, and that we would truly see our neighbors as You see them. Bless us, Lord, as we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Closing him is 399. Take my life and let it be. Let's stand.
What must I do to inherit eternal life? Love God. Love your neighbor. Do this and you will live. Who showed mercy to the man who fell in the ditch? Go and do likewise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.